Fake emulsification is an elegant and artistic procedure. Its advantages are responsible for its growing popularity, yet mastering the operation can be a formidable challenge which continues as we attempt to keep up with constantly evolving techniques. Hence the justification for a new video journal, International Advances in Phaco Emulsification. I'm Bob Osher from Cincinnati, Ohio, and I hope you'll join me and our host, Chiron Intraoptics, as we visit the operating rooms of the leaders and pioneers who are advancing the art of phaco emulsification around the globe. Our first stop will be in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, where we'll observe the masterful surgery and award-winning videography of Dr. Howard Gimbel. It's in this northwestern community, more known for its famous Calgary stampede and spectacular Rocky Mountain neighbor that Dr. Gimbel performs several thousand surgeries each year in Canada's first outpatient ophthalmic surgery center. His pioneering work on both anterior and posterior capsulorexis, in combination with his innovative divide-and-conquer nuclear practice technique, has enhanced the safety of phaco emulsification while elevating this operation to new surgical heights. In the human lens, there are different lamellar zones, starting with the fetal nucleus, which becomes the hard central nucleus as new lens fibers are laid down throughout life. These fibers join in a Y suture anteriorly and posteriorly. Here the Y suture is demonstrated during sculpting through the nucleus of this cataract. There are natural fault lines in the lens corresponding to these radial fibers that are laid down throughout life. The lens develops in layers, the last of which is cortex, but orientation of the lens fibers also creates radial cleavage planes through which cracks can be made. Before beginning phaco emulsification, I routinely use hydrodissection starting first with hydro-free dissection, lifting the capsule without irrigation, extending as far as can be reached to manually separate the anterior capsule from the cortex. This is followed by injecting a fluid wave posteriorly, causing hydrodissection between the cortex and capsule. Rotation of the lens after hydrodissection ensures that it is completely separated from the capsule facilitating rotation for subsequent fracturing. Note that the nucleus is stabilized with a second instrument, which also helps to stabilize the eye. A long sculpting pass is made with the phaco tip, and then the second instrument nudges the nucleus inferiorly. Slowing down the video here will give a better indication of what is happening. The nucleus is nudged inferiorly, and the phaco tip sculpts in the upper part of the lens down the slope of the concave posterior capsule. After a few passes, the instrument tips are placed deep in the nucleus and fracturing is accomplished while maintaining irrigation and aspiration only. This fracture should extend through the nucleus and epinucleus from the 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock position as illustrated here. Note that the right hemisection is pushed away freely by the spatula, indicating a complete fracture. The lens is rotated slightly clockwise, and the phaco tip then buries into this hemisection, and while maintaining irrigation aspiration, a segment is broken off. While the spatula is holding back the rest of the lens, this segment is then emulsified. In real time now, the nucleus is nudged inferiorly with the spatula as the phaco tip debulks the superior portion of the lens, sculpting parallel to the concave posterior capsule. The instrument tips are placed deep in the lens and using direct action nucleofractus, a fracture is made. The lens is quickly rotated clockwise with a second instrument and a second fracture is made near the first. Subsequent fracturing after the first initial fracture is accomplished without any pre-grooving except in dense burnescent nuclei. This fracturing takes advantage of the radial fault lines inherent in the radial orientation of the lens fibers. With this technique, it is not necessary to pre-groove these moderate sclerotic lenses to weaken the nucleus. 
With these radial cleavage planes, fractures are easily accomplished without any pre-grooving. As illustrated here, even without hydrodelineation, the nucleus has spontaneously separated from the epinucleus, which was fractured along with the nucleus. The epinucleus is easily removed using low flow and vacuum with the help of the second instrument to maneuver the material to the phaco port. The change from traditional sculpting to downslope sculpting is a subtle one. The sculpting is done mostly in the upper two-thirds of the central nucleus by nudging the nucleus inferiorly. Complete hydrodissection facilitates this move. If the sculpting is done in the upper pole of the lens, superior to the center, it reduces the chance of a posterior capsule rupture with the phaco port during sculpting. With traditional techniques, if the nucleus is broken through unexpectedly, the tip is somewhat more perpendicular to the capsule because of the upslope capsule inferiorly. With downslope sculpting, when reaching the end of each sculpting pass, there is considerable nuclear material ahead of the tip. Breaking through is therefore unlikely with this cushion present. This case illustrates how the downslope sculpting technique lends itself to dense mature lenses. No pre-grooving of this lens will be required for fracturing. Because this is a denser lens, time must be spent debulking the superior portion of it. A small trench is made with the phaco tip in order to give the second instrument a notch to push against for nudging the nucleus inferiorly. Once sculpted, the nucleus is nudged toward six o'clock. Sculpting is then accomplished in the superior portion of the lens, parallel to the concave posterior capsule. When attempting the first fracture of these lenses, either direct action fracturing or cross action fracturing, crossing the second instrument and the phaco tip over one another can be used. Here the two instrument tips are placed deep in the center of the lens and a direct action fracturing method is used. Especially in these dense mature lenses, it may be necessary to reposition the tips further superiorly to crack the posterior plate as illustrated here. As before, the second fracture is made by rotating the lens clockwise and with a burst of ultrasonic power, the tip engages the nucleus. Using the second instrument for stabilization, a fracture is obtained through radial cleavage planes isolating the segment of the nucleus. In softer lenses, I make four or five fractures in the cataractus material in these denser lenses, however, six, seven, or even eight sections are made for more manageability due to the difficulty of handling large, dense segments. In very dense, rubbery, burnescent lenses, it is desirable to debulk even more of the center of the lens before any fracture is made. Once the lens center is debulked, fracturing is initiated into the nuclear rim, dividing it into small, manageable segments. Because of the crater made before fracturing, we have used the term crater divide and conquer for this technique. In most dense cases, however I decide to fracture, I will leave the segments in the bag until all fractures are completed. This allows for greater stability during phacoemulsification, particularly at the end of fracturing the nucleus into segments. In this case, after fracturing into six segments, the first segment is brought to the center of the lens for emulsification. High flow and high vacuum and low ultrasonic power will help to keep those segments fast to the tip, reducing the chances of the segments tumbling into the chamber. In general, the more dense the lens, the smaller the segments should be. If the segments are too big after initial fracturing, additional fracturing can be obtained as the segment is engaged with the phaco tip. I originally developed the downslope sculpting technique in small pupil cases due to the limitation of view and the desirability of keeping the phaco tip near the center of the lens. Because small pupils may have smaller capsule openings, care must be taken when utilizing downslope sculpting to prevent damage to the upper portion of the capsule or the upper zonal ligaments. Slowing down here will help to indicate what the spatula and phaco tip are doing during downslope sculpting. The spatula is used to stabilize and nudge the nucleus inferiorly. The nucleus can be nudged and stabilized either by placing the tip of the spatula in a notch in the inferior section of the trench or by placing the tip on top of the nucleus itself. This is particularly appropriate if the nucleus is quite hard. 
With the nucleus nudged inferiorly, the phaco tip sculpts a trench or trough or debulks the superior portion of the lens. Once this area has been sufficiently debulked, the instrument tips are placed deep in the lens and using direct action fracturing, the spatula pushing to the left, the phaco tip pushing to the right, a fracture is made. Rotating the lens slightly clockwise allows the tip to embed itself into the nuclear wall. Notice that the second fracture is made by taking advantage of the radial cleavage planes of the lens itself. No ultrasonic power is used to make this fracture. With the spatula stabilizing the left hemisection, the segment is emulsified in the center of the lens. Reviewing the beginning of the case once again, we can see the efficiency of the downslope sculpting technique. The spatula nudges the nucleus inferiorly while the phaco tip debulks the superior portion of the lens. The instrument tips are placed deep in the nucleus and fracturing is accomplished with irrigation aspiration only. Rotating the lens slightly clockwise with the spatula allows the tip to embed itself into the nuclear wall. Notice that the second fracture is made by taking advantage of the radial cleavage planes of the lens itself. The segment is brought to the center for emulsification. Notice too that the phaco tip stays mainly in the center of the lens. There is a distinct advantage to nuclear fractice techniques in small pupils because one does not need to go under the iris for emulsification. The risk of the iris flowing unexpectedly with the lens material into the tip of the phaco port is thus reduced. If the tip is under the capsule or iris, it is usually in irrigation aspiration mode only. It is mandatory to use a lower flow in small pupil cases. It reduces efficiency, but increases the safety of phaco techniques in small pupils. After the nucleus has been removed, the remaining soft epinucleus can be removed as a bowl, also with low flow and low vacuum. Firm epinucleus will usually fracture with the nucleus, but may remain as a sheet of rather firm material, which has to be brought to the center for emulsification. In summary, with downslope sculpting, complete and efficient fracturing and subsequent emulsification can be accomplished by sculpting deeply and fracturing through the entire posterior plate of the nucleus. Rather than utilizing grooves to start the fractures, the surgeon simply needs to get instruments deep into the center to fracture through the naturally occurring radial fault lines of the lens. The principal advantage of the downslope technique is that pre-grooving the nucleus for subsequent fracturing is completely unnecessary except in dense brunescent nuclei. I've come all the way to Paris to interview Howard and ask you, is the divide and conquer nuclear fractus technique for everyone or just the expert surgeon? About this technique of divide and conquer nuclear fractus is the, a great advantage in difficult and challenging cases such as small pupils and in loose zonial cases. But I think it offers safety for the surgeon in transition because the sculpting, particularly with downslope sculpting, is done in the safe central zone of the lens. And if fracturing is obtained, the emulsification progresses easily. If fracturing cannot be obtained, then one can still convert to the extracapsular technique for a safe outcome of the surgery.